Um, this is our um, a 51st annual B.W. Teigen Reformation Lecture Series. First lecturer, uh, as it shows in your notes, in your brochure, was Dr. Hermann Sassi in 1965. The purpose of these lectures has, has been to increase a knowledge of and an interest in the Reformation period. In that important period, the central article of the faith, justification by faith alone, was restored uh, to its purity, and that's our emphasis as Lutheran Christians. The article of justification that we are declared righteous, we're justified, not by anything that we do or accomplish, but alone on the basis of Christ's redemptive work. He won salvation for all. He announced it to all through his glorious resurrection, declaring all the world righteous in himself, and he brings it to us in the means of grace, working faith in our hearts to receive that treasure. This year, the theme of the lectures is the Evangelical Lutheran Synod, Three Perspectives. And it centers in the fact that this is the 100th anniversary of the reorganization of our Synod in 1918, uh, originally called the Norwegian Synod in our Norwegian heritage, that emphasis there. It also emphasizes, the, the, the essays will also emphasize our relationship uh, with the sibling church bodies that were part of the Synodical Conference, uh, which began in 1872 and came to, a, came to an end in 1967. Um, uh, the, 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 the treasured relationships that we had there. Our presenters, our presenters this morning are Dr. John Brenner uh, from Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, we have Dr. Lawrence Rast. Do you want to be junior, too? It's OK either way. It's OK either way. OK, from Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne. We didn't know he was a junior, a junior until about a month ago. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the Reverend Craig Firkenstadt, the secretary of the Evangelical Lutheran Synod. And Craig is also uh, one of our um, main Norwegian historians among us. See, he's done a uh, he's done fantastic work uh, per, for our centennial, including a book. But we'll wait for him till tomorrow. Uh, we are we're here with Brenner today. So Brenner, okay, that's what I normally call him. Uh, but I've got to I've got to be more formal this morning. So uh, our face, our first speaker is Dr. John Brenner. Uh, and he will speak on the ELS, a Wells perspective. Dr. Brenner is a, 70, is a 1977 graduate of Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. He served as the dean's assistant at Northwestern College. That was, I bet, a real thankful job. Uh, a, a he was a parish pastor in Big Rapids, Michigan, wherever that is. So, and 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 he was dean of students at Michigan Seminary. I do know where that is. Since 1991. He's been there a long time, 1991, just think of it. Uh, I hope all of you were born at that time. Uh, he, he, he taught church history, uh, the Lutheran confessions, Christian education, and, and systematics uh, at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. He was also the dean of students there from 95 to 2015. Uh, he is uh, taught a wide variety of things, as we can see. Uh, uh, Professor Brenner has done additional study at Saginaw Valley State University, the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and Marquette, where he completed his PhD program in historical theology. 
He is the author of conversion, not by my own choosing in the People's Bible Study series. The election controversy among Lutherans in the 20th century, uh, which is an excellent book showing the election controversy from the viewpoint of the German Synod. It is an excellent book. And he is co-author of Jars of Clay, the History of Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. He, is, he currently serves as chairman of the Wells Commission on Interchurch Relations, the CICR, and is a member of the Theological Commission of the Confessional Evangelical Lutheran Conference. Uh, Professor Brenner and his wife, who is sitting right here in the second row, uh, making sure that he's got it all straight today. Uh, his wife, Patricia, and they have a son who is right next to her, and that's Nathaniel, uh, who serves as the Wells pastor in Fort Wayne, Indiana, by the way, over there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nathaniel and his wife, Jennifer, have two children. Uh, his son-in-law is also here, who's a pastor in our Senate. So with that, I have, before I got to keep on the script here, <laughs> gotta be straight. Okay, uh, so that you understand what's going on. We will have one lecture now this afternoon at two o'clock, we'll have the second lecture, and tomorrow morning at 10.30 we will have the third lecture that will occur. This evening, uh, not evening, late in the afternoon, about 4.30, there is going to be a, um, uh, a Reformation Choral Vesper service that everyone is invited to. And uh, as always, uh, this, our, uh, uh, our style here is a free conference style. We consider us to be out of the bonds of fellowship. Everyone is welcome to uh, participate, ask questions, discuss, disagree, and so forth. So with that, we welcome Dr. Brenner. Thank you, Schmeling. That's, <laughs> That's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. That's right, right. Bring your greetings from the faculty, staff, and student body of Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. I'm very happy to be here. It's a real honor to have been asked to be a presenter at the B.W. Teigen Reformation Lectures in the year that the Evangelical Lutheran Synod is celebrating the 100th anniversary of its founding. Anniversaries offer the opportunity to take stock of the past and thank the Lord of the Church for his amazing grace and blessings. The question you've asked me to address is, how a Wells member perceives the history of the ELS and its relationship with the Wells? The topic is a bit problematic because I cannot speak for the average member of the Wisconsin Synod who knows little about the history of the ELS and unfortunately not much more about the history of his own synod. Most Wells pastors have a general knowledge of the history of their sister synod, but most have not had the opportunity to study that history in detail or to interact with the ELS in any official capacity. That's a shame because the more we understand about the history of our two synods and how our synods have interacted, the more we will be amazed at God's grace and faithfulness to his promises. This essay will be a personal reflection offering an overview of the historical relationship between ELS and Wells. It will describe a history and relationship that demonstrates God's grace in preserving each as a confessional Lutheran synod and preserving a fellowship that provides benefits for both synods. That fellowship should never be taken for granted. To understand the history of the Evangelical Lutheran Synod and the Wisconsin Synod, we need to look at the historical roots of each. Those roots stretch back to the late 18th and 19th centuries. That confessional Lutheranism came to America from Europe and survived can be attributed to God's grace alone. The 18th century Enlightenment, with its exaltation of human reason and the development of the various critical approaches to Scripture, had a devastating impact on Lutheranism in Europe. By the late 18th and early 19th century, opposition to the Enlightenment mentality began to be apparent. 
Bible-believing Christians started to band together to present a united front over against the rationalists and those who were robbing Christians of the central truths of the Bible. One such organization was the Deutsche Christentum Gesellschaft, founded in Basel in 1780. Our purpose is that in days when men seek to weaken the foundations of Christianity, the Christians of all confessions must be kept together. Such organizations were unionistic by their very nature, willing to overlook what they considered the minor doctrinal differences between Lutherans and Reformed in order to oppose the greater danger posed by the unbelief of the age. A number of mission houses or training schools and mission societies grew out of these Christian societies. The Wisconsin Synod was founded by men trained and sent out by such unionistic groups. Depending upon who was the head of the institution at the time, some of the pastors came to America with better Lutheran training than others. Prussia was an overwhelmingly Lutheran territory, yet had German Reformed Luth uh, rulers, beginning with Elector John Sigismund, who converted to the Reformed faith in 1613. His conversion set the stage for problems because of the cuius regius religio principle that governed much of Europe after the Peace of Augsburg and the Peace of Westphalia. Some 200 years later, Frederick William III, distressed because he could not commune with his Lutheran wife or the majority of his subjects, attempted to remedy the situation by forcing the Lutherans and Reformed in his realm to unite into one evangelical Christian church in the infamous Prussian Union. He encouraged other German territories to follow suit. On September 27, 1817, he announced the union of the Lutherans and Reformed into one congregation at the court and in the military at Potsdam. By 1834, the union agenda was prescribed. Confessional Lutherans began to stand up in opposition. Writing from outside Prussia in Schleswig-Holstein in 1817, Klaus Harms issued a new edition, an anniversary edition of Luther's 95 Theses, together with 95 Theses of his own. Harm's work served as a wake-up call. His theses opposed rationalism, Kantianism, and the Prussian Union, and had a profound effect in Prussia and throughout Germany. His 75th Thesis declared, As a poor maiden, the Lutheran Church is now to be made rich by being married. Do not perform the ceremony over Luther's bones, they will become alive at it, and then woe to you. <laughs> to a certain extent, that was prophetic. After the death of Frederick William III in 1840, the government allowed the establishment of free churches. However, before and after his death, the religious conditions in Germany prompted some confessional Lutherans to emigrate to the United States and Australia. The Prussian emigration in 1839 under John Grabau and Heinrich von Rohr resulted in the founding of the Buffalo Synod in Milwaukee in 1845. Reacting to religious conditions in their homeland, a group of Saxons under the leadership of Martin Stephan emigrated to Missouri and settled in Perry County and in St. Louis. The Saxons and the Franconians, who basically were in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, that area, joined to form the Missouri Synod in 1847. The confessional revival also produced a couple of mission societies that were much more strongly Lutheran than others. The Neuendettelsau Missionary Society was founded in 1841 by Wilhelm Lea. Lea sent numerous pastors and candidates for the ministry as well as whole colonies to the United States as well as providing for the establishment of Concordia Seminary in Fort Wayne in 1846. Louis Harms, Hermansburg Mission Society, sent men to Africa and America. John Bodding, the second president of the Wisconsin Synod, one of the prime movers in leading Wisconsin to a greater confessionalism, received his training at Hermansburg. The number of those involved in the confessional revival in Germany was never large, but they had an influence in both Germany and in America. The rising tide of confessionalism raised Lutheran consciousness in nearly every synod in America, 
but only in a few did it have a lasting impact. Lutheranism in Norway in the 19th century had a number of competing tendencies. Pietism had made an impact by the early 18th century because Denmark ruled Norway until 1814. Is that date correct? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. <laughs> um, now I lost my place. Religious developments in Denmark affected Norway as well. Most notably, the exposition of Luther's small catechism by the Norwegian-Danish professor and bishop, Eric Pentapadan, entitled Truth and the Godliness, was as influential as it was popular. Pentapadan's exposition was mildly pietistic and taught election in tua tu fide, in view of faith. Pentapadan did not go into much of an explanation of the doctrine of election, but merely used the expression that had become popular among the Lutheran dogmaticians of the 17th and 18th centuries. The popularity of his exposition of the small catechism served to ingrain the expression in the minds of the Norwegian laity. This catechism was brought to America by Norwegian immigrants and was rather quickly translated into English. A new pietistic awakening took place in Norway in the late 18th and early 19th centuries through the efforts of Hans Hauge, the son of a farmer and the champion of the working and middle class. Hauge read Luther and Pantapadan in his youth and was familiar with some of the literature produced by the pietists in Germany. On April 5, 1796, Hauge had a profound religious experience which led him to believe that he had a call from God to arouse his fellow countrymen from their spiritual sleep. For the next several years, he traversed Norway as an itinerant lay preacher. He was repeatedly arrested for violations of the Conventicle Act, which forbade any religious gatherings not supervised by a state-approved minister. Most of the time, the authorities released him after a short imprisonment, but in 1804, he was arrested and imprisoned for seven years. He was released in 1811, but sentenced in 1813 to two more years of prison, and in 1814 to pay a fine for violations of the Conventicle Act. After his release, he retired on a farm near Oslo, a broken man, but also somewhat of a national hero. And like many of the pietists in Germany, Hauge cautioned his followers against separatism from the state church. His followers developed a low church party within the Lutheran Church of Norway, emphasizing lay preaching, simple worship, obedience, and sanctification rather than justification. The Haugean lay preaching movement made its way to America. Its most famous representative in America was Elling Eilson. In Denmark, Nikolai Grundtvig, a university-trained Lutheran pastor, was refused to perish for many years because of his dedication to confessional Lutheranism. In 1824, Grundtvig experienced what he called his matchless discovery, in which he determined that the Bible was the dead word of God and the Apostles' Creed and the words of institution of the two sacraments constituted the living word of God. He believed that the words of the Apostles' Creed had literally been given by the Apostles themselves. Since the Creed and the words and institution were used in the church from the beginning, they constituted the living Word of God. This living Word of God could serve as the basis for church union. Grundtvig was also a nationalist who became an authority on Anglo-Saxon and Norse literature. He promoted folk high schools and authored many hymns. His followers became the most rationalistic of the church parties in Denmark. There was also a confessional Lutheran movement in Norway. The University of Christiana, later the University of Oslo, was founded in 1811. Here, Gisli Jonsson exerted a strong influence on Norwegian church life through his teaching at Christiana. Jonsson had studied under Adolf von Harles at the University of Leipzig. He brought to Christiana a confessional Lutheran spirit that embraced Lutheran orthodoxy and that sought to awaken the spiritual life of the church in Norway. He sought to imbue his students with a spirit of orthodoxy which blended the passion and subjectivity of a revival preacher with the intellect of an orthodox systematician. Many in the state church were opposed to the Haugian lay preaching movement, but Jonsson believed that in an emergency, an unordained layman could preach. 
He worked to establish congregational rights in selecting and calling pastors and tried to establish a, natural, a national church assembly to separate the administration of the church from the state. He supported the intermission movement in Norway that aimed at evangelism, the distribution of Christian literature, missions, charitable work, and so forth. He also took an interest in the Norwegians who had emigrated to America. Jonsson's work was augmented by Carl P. Kasperi, a Jewish convert to Lutheranism. Kasperi was an Old Testament scholar of confessional Lutheran convictions. Most of the early pastors of the Norwegian Synod received a confessional Lutheran training at the University of Christiana. They brought to America an antipathy toward Grundvigianism and a suspicion of the lay preaching movement. Early relations between our synods. Wisconsin Synod was founded in 1850 by men who had been sent to America by unionistic mission societies. They founded a new Lutheran rather than an old Lutheran synod. In fact, they did not want to have anything to do with the old Lutherans of the Buffalo or Missouri synods, which are already doing work in and around Milwaukee. The Wisconsin Synod pledged to all the Lutheran confessions in the confessional paragraph of the Synod's constitution, but they were willing to serve German Reformed congregations as well. Soon pastors who had received a better Lutheran training were arriving in Wisconsin and joining the Synod. Under the influence of men like John Bodding, Philip Kaler, he's kind of an unsung hero. We don't hear too much about him. He's the father of the great uh, Wisconsin Synod historian J.P. Kaler. Uh, he was kind of a power behind the scenes, moving us towards greater confessionalism. And Gottlieb Brine, the Synod began to move in a steadily more Lutheran direction. Adolf Heineke, a university-trained theologian, provided important theological leadership. By 1868, the Synod was ready to make a complete break with Unionism. The Synodical Convention in Racine that year broke with the Unionistic European Mission Societies, took a clear stand on the four points of the General Council, which led to the Synod leaving that organization the following year, and directed Synod President John Bodding to initiate talks with the Missouri Synod. Let me just stop there. If, there. if there's a pivotal year in the history of the Wisconsin Synod, a formative year, it's 1868. Uh, because of the break with those mission societies, a break with the General Council, uh, overtures for fellowship to the Missouri Synod. Walther and the Missouri Synod have been critical of the Wisconsin Synod's ties to the Unionistic European Mission Societies and the Synod's lax practice on the congregational level. In addition, there were problems between Wisconsin Synod and Missouri Synod congregations, particularly in the Watertown area. Missouri's periodicals, Der Luteraner and Lehr and Vera, did not hesitate to point out and criticize Wisconsin's failings. As time went on, there was less and less justification for these criticisms. Discussions with Missouri proceeded rapidly and with great success. After the convention's close, Bodding traveled to Milwaukee to present the resolution to Missouri's Northern District, which was then meeting in convention. Walther was present and suggested that the committee to be appointed by the Northern District should represent the whole Missouri Synod. The meeting between Wisconsin and Missouri took place on October 21st, 22nd, 1868 in Milwaukee. The two sides discussed all of the doctrinal questions at issue among Lutherans of that day. One of the big ones would have been the open questions of the Iowa Synod. The discussion demonstrated complete doctrinal unity to the joy of all the participants. Walther, who had been a sharp critic of Wisconsin, showed himself to be a man of Christian humility and integrity by writing in the November 1st edition of Der Luteraner, all of our reservations about the dear Wisconsin Synod have not only faded, but have been put to shame. God be thanked for his inexpressible gift. Kaler reports that Walther closed the meeting with Wisconsin with this declaration. Brethren, if we had known before what we know now, we might have declared our unity of faith ten years ago. Both synods declared fellowship at their 1869 conventions 
setting the stage for the founding of the Evangelical Lutheran Synodical Conference of North America. The Michigan Synod and the Minnesota Synod, both of which merged with Wisconsin in 1917 after having entered into a federation with that synod in 1892, followed a similar confessional development. Norwegian emigration to America in large numbers began in the decade of the 1850s, peaking in the 1880s and in the first decade of the 20th century. The state church in Norway by the mid-19th century had elements of a re revived Lutheran confessionalism, Haugian pietism, Grundvigian rationalism, low church tendencies, and high church tendencies. The Jansonian revival of confessional Lutheranism was dominant, but Norwegian Lutherans brought all these elements to America. To a certain extent, the divisions in the Lutheran Church in Norway became amplified in America. Already in 1851, three pastors, Klaus Clausen, H.H. Stubb, A.C. Price, and representatives of six congregations formed the Norwegian Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. In 1852, their numbers were augmented by newly arrived pastors, Hermann Amberg Price, G.F. Dietrichson, and Nils O'Brandt. H.A. Preuss soon recognized a Grundvigian error in the constitution of the newly founded synod. The confessional paragraph tended to place the baptismal confession, the Apostles' Creed, above scripture as the criterion of Christian teaching. Preuss moved to strike the error, and when the motion passed, the synod had to dissolve itself because it had changed one of the unalterable articles of the constitution. In 1853, a new constitution was adopted, and the Norwegian Evangelical Lutheran Church in America was founded a second time. This group was popularly known as the Norwegian Synod. The Norwegian Synod soon developed very close relations with the Missouri Synod and entered into a worker training agreement with Missouri in 1857. The Norwegian Synod agreed to supply a professor from Missouri's Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, and Concordia would train Norwegian students to serve as pastors in the Norwegian Synod. The Synod resolution stated, this temporary arrangement would bring a threefold advantage, provide teachers for the church in the near future, help the Synod to gain experience before starting its own school, three, bring the Synod into contact with a church body which had been established on a truly Lutheran foundation, and thus help it to become strengthened in the knowledge of Christian doctrine and of matters pertaining to church government. The close relationship between the Missouri Synod and the Norwegian Synod led the latter to become a charter member of the Synodical Conference in 1872. At the founding of the Synodical Conference, the Norwegian Synod was asked to pledge itself to all the confessions in the Book of Concord. The Lutheran Church in Norway pledged only to Luther's small catechism and the Augsburg Confession. Since the Norwegians had neither been a part of the controversies leading to the writing of the Formula of Concord, nor involved in the gathering of the Book of Concord, the Norwegian Lutheran Church had never subscribed to the other confessions contained in the Book of Concord. The minutes of the founding convention of the Synodical Conference offer this explanation. But since the Honorable Norwegian Synod has attached to its complete assent to the Constitution, the question whether it should enter the Synodical Conference as a member, even though as an individual synod it pledge itself as is well known only to the unaltered Augsburg Confession and Luther's small catechism, the explanation was given by the Synodical Conference that the Scandinavian Lutherans had always been regarded as orthodox, even though not all symbolical books had achieved official ecclesiastical recognition among them. Nevertheless, the Synodical Conference naturally demands that the Honorable Norwegian Lutheran Synod, insofar as it is part of the Synodical Conference, pledge itself to all the confessional writings of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, and in the event of a doctrinal controversy, to be guided and judged thereby. Since this was agreed to by the representatives of the Honorable Norwegian Synod, the conference found no impediment to its acceptance. Both the Norwegian Synod and the Wisconsin Synod were active in the events leading up to the founding of the Synodical Conference and the early years of its organization. A preliminary meeting was held January 11th to 13th, 1871 at a Missouri Synod Church in Chicago. 
Representatives from the Missouri, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Norwegian synods attended. President of the Illinois Synod was present but did not actively participate because his synod was still a member of the General Council. Meeting in six three-hour sessions, the representatives drafted a constitution for consideration and adoption by their respective synods. When the November meeting convened at Pastor Wilhelm Seeler's St. Paul's Church in Fort Wayne, representatives of the Minnesota and Illinois synods were also present. Both of these synods had recently left the General Council for confessional reasons. The proposed constitution with a few minor changes was to be presented to the constituent synods for approval as the basis for the formation of the Synodical Conference. Professor Friedrich Schmidt of the Norwegian Synod presented a paper entitled Memorandum Containing a Detailed Explanation of the Reasons Why the Synods That Are Uniting into the Synodical Conference of the Evangelical Lutheran Church are unable to join one of the already existing so-called associations of synods in our country. In those days, if you read a title, you knew what the paper would be about. <laughs> His essay pointed out the deficiencies in the General Synod, the United Synod South, and the General Council. The first convention of the Synodical Conference was held at the Church of Wisconsin's president, Pastor John Bodding, July 10th through 16th, 1872. 136 pastors, professors, teachers, and laymen assembled. 60 of these were voting delegates chosen by the individual synods according to the provisions of the proposed constitution. Walther delivered the sermon at the opening service. He preached on 1 Timothy 4.16 using the theme, how important it is that we above all make the saving of souls the purpose of our joint work in the kingdom of Christ. Walther was also elected the first president. The delegates heard two essays. Matthias Loy of the Ohio Synod presented, What is our task toward the English-speaking people of our country? Loy reminded his hearers of their mission responsibilities as confessional Lutherans. Friedrich Schmidt presented his theses on justification. The essay involved a lengthy exposition of the cardinal teaching of scripture on the basis of 12 theses. Among the problems that were troubling American Lutheranism and would continue to cause trouble well into the future was the question of the universal aspect of justification. Schmidt addressed the relationship of universal justification and the individual's appropriation of justification in several theses. The essay was timely because of a dispute between the Norwegian Synod and the Augustana and Iowa Synods at the time. The founding of the Synodical Conference brought the Wisconsin Synod and the Norwegian Synod into fellowship and a working relationship. 1872 to 1890. The Synodical Conference started on a positive note but soon had disagreements. The first was a state synod controversy involving the attempt to organize all the German synods along geographical lines. The Norwegian synod was not involved in this controversy because it wasn't a German synod. Although the controversy involved some heated exchanges, it did not really disrupt the conference because it involved adiaphoran. The election controversy, however, disrupted both the synodical conference and the Norwegian synod and remained a significant factor in the relationship of various Lutheran synods well into the 20th century. The chief protagonist in the election controversy in the Synodical Conference was the Norwegian Synod's Professor Friedrich Schmidt. Schmidt had been a student of Walther's, in fact, Walther actually confirmed him, and a colleague of his at St. Louis. Schmidt had learned Norwegian while a student at St. Louis so that he could serve as a proofreader for the Norwegian Lutheran paper, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that. <laughs> Erling taught me how to, but I'm not so sure my tongue works for that. <laughs> he soon also began to preach occasionally for a group of Norwegian Lutherans in St. Louis. While serving as a pastor in Baltimore, Maryland, he was visited by the Norwegian Lutheran leader, Hermann Amberg Preuss. Preuss was surprised during their conversation when it became evident that Schmidt could speak Norwegian. He asked Schmidt to teach at the Norwegian Synod's Luther College at Halfway Creek, Iowa. The uh, college later moved to Decorah. 1872, Schmidt left Luther College and came to St. Louis 
to serve as the Norwegian Synod's professor at Missouri Seminary. When the Norwegian Synod founded a seminary of its own in Madison, Wisconsin in 1876, it was only natural for Schmidt to be called to serve at that institution. In 1879, Schmidt challenged Walther's teaching on election and soon had about one-third of the Norwegian Synod's pastors and congregations on his side. Part of the appeal in Schmidt's teaching came from the nearly universal use of Pantopidon's catechism among Norwegian Lutherans. Question 548 of Pantopidon's exposition of Luther's small catechism taught election in view of faith. What is election? God has appointed all those to eternal life who he from eternity has foreseen would accept the offered grace, believe in Christ, and remain constant in this faith unto the end. Schmidt was opposed by the leaders of the Norwegian Synod, including President Preuss, Pastor Jacob Ottesen, and the Norwegian Walther, Pastor Ulrich Koren. By the way, just let me uh, give a shout out to Mark DeGarmo. That, that four-volume translation of, of Koren's works is outstanding. It just is outstanding. I hope it finds a wide readership in America. Uh, Koren has a lot to offer us. Koren was especially noteworthy for his theological leadership. Schmidt and his followers accused the leaders of the Norwegian Synod of blindly following Walther and his new doctrine of election. Koren maintained that the doctrine that Walther taught was the doctrine that they had learned from Gisli Jonsson at the University of Christiana. Koren explained, the claim was made that a new doctrine had come into being in Missouri. This frightened many. How untrue this was has been demonstrated by Professor Fritsch and Stub, by President Halverson, the Reverend J. Thorson, and other pastors besides several laymen. The Norwegian pastors had this doctrine with them from Norway. It was taught at the university and in the main points, just as in the Missouri Synod. In 1882, Schmidt was chosen to be one of the Norwegian Synod's delegates to the Synodical Conference Convention. Missouri refused to seat him as a delegate because he had accused the Synod of false doctrine. Wisconsin joined with Missouri because Schmidt had interfered in Wisconsin's congregation in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, really made a mess. His interference resulted in the majority of the Oshkosh congregation leaving the Synod and a minority founding a new Wisconsin Synod congregation, which they named Grace. That was significant because of election by grace alone. Um, fully 10 of the 11 sessions of the 1882 convention dealt with Schmidt and the election controversy. In 1883, the Norwegian Synod withdrew from the Synodical Conference in order to deal with the growing problem in their midst. The Synod, however, remained in fellowship with the conference. A later historian explained, in 1883, the Norwegian Synod also resolved to withdraw from the Synodical Conference, not because of disagreement in doctrine with the other synods, but because it hoped that a settlement of the controversy that raged within the Synod itself might more easily be reached. Since the discussions in the Synodical Conference were carried on for the greater part in the German language, which was not understood by the majority of the Norwegians, it was feared membership in this body would complicate matters and make a settlement more difficult. Prior to the withdrawal from the Synodical Conference, the dispute within the Norwegian Synod had become quite heated. Both sides printed pamphlets and published articles and periodicals. Schmidt's battle against Walther had become a civil war in the Norwegian Synod. Through the influence of Schmidt, uh, the congregation at Norway Grove near De Forest, Wisconsin, deposed their pastors, father and son. On Good Friday, 1883, supporters of Schmidt actually carried President Hermann Amberg Preuss physically out of his own church. In 1884, the Norwegian Synod Convention in Minneapolis discussed a set of theses produced by a peace committee, but did not succeed in bringing about a reconciliation. That fall, the General Pastoral Conference met in Decorah, Iowa and discussed a document prepared by Ulrich Koren entitled, 
and accounting to the congregations of the Norwegian Synod. In the introductory paragraphs, Koren complained that the Norwegian Synod majority had been charged with errors of two kinds. The one set consisted of doctrine they had never taught and actually had repudiated. Koren no doubt had in mind the accusation that they taught irresistible grace and contradictory wills in God. Nevertheless, their opponents continued to accuse them of teaching what they had indeed rejected. The second set consisted of doctrine which they taught and confessed because it was the doctrine of Scripture and the Lutheran confessions. Koran undoubtedly meant the rejection of faith as a cause of election and the rejection of the teaching that some unregenerate human beings resist the Holy Spirit less than others. He continues by explaining the purpose of this accounting. We owe our congregations an accounting for what we teach and confess, and although we dare to believe that our hearers both know our testimony and will judge it by what they hear of us and not by what others say, we have still considered it our duty to present to you this our common complete accounting in which we hope no essential question that concerns the disputed doctrines has been unanswered. The accounting included theses on universal grace, conversion, election, and the certainty of, by faith, of preservation in faith and salvation. His theses on these doctrines echoed the teaching of Walther. Korn's approach to theology was also the same as that of Walther, Heineke, and the other theologians of the Synodical Conference. Reason must be taken captive to allow clear but apparently contradictory statements to stand, and one must formulate doctrine from the passages of Scripture that treat that doctrine, not from passages that treat other doctrines. There is no real contradiction between Scripture's doctrine of universal grace and that of election, although these doctrines cannot be harmonized by reason. He who seeks to harmonize them before the judgment of reason will not succeed in doing so except by limiting or changing one or the other of them and must on the one hand depart from the scripture doctrine concerning election and on the other hand from the scripture doctrine of the universality of God's grace or from scripture's doctrine concerning man's complete corruption. Scripture gives us no other explanation than that in Hosea 13:9, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Every article of faith must be sought in those scripture passages in which the respective doctrine is specially and thoroughly treated by the holy writers. Other passages in which the doctrine is only incidentally mentioned must be explained in accordance with those passages. It is therefore an improper way to treat Scripture when people in the doctrine of election partly set aside more or less those passages where this teaching is specially and thoroughly treated, partly want to explain these in accordance with such passages as either treat this doctrine only in passing or do not treat it at all. Uh, they tried to explain the doctrine of election on the basis of passages dealing with justification by grace. The Synodical Conference Confession say, no, you draw justification by grace through faith from those passages that treat that. You draw the doctrine of election from those passages that treat the doctrine of election. The majority of the Norwegian Synod's pastors and professors signed the accounting, but Schmidt and an anti-Missourian minority refused. The latter group met in Red Wing, Minnesota in October of 1885 and adopted some far-reaching resolutions. They resolved that all who assigned the accounting and did not recant were to be deposed from office. Duke Harstead, the president of the Minnesota district, and Ulrich Corin, the president of the Iowa district, were among those they believed should be removed. They also resolved that Hans G. Stube and uh, Johannes Ilvesacker should be removed from their teaching positions as seminary professors at the Norwegian Seminary in Madison, Wisconsin. In 1886, the anti-Missourians established a seminary of their own at St. Olaf's School in Northfield, Minnesota. 
St. Olaf's had been founded in 1874 by an independent group from the Norwegian Synod. Since the school was independent, the Synod did not have direct supervision, and St. Olaf's became affiliated with the Anti-Missourians and their successor Synod. In 1887, the Norwegian Synod took action, declaring that the opening of an opposition seminary was divisive. The Synod and Convention passed the following resolution by a vote of 230 to 98. The Synod cannot but consider the erection, the erection of a new theological school at Norfield as an act of opposition to break down the Synod schools which have been established in accordance with its constitution. As a breach of the Synod's constitution and of the obligations those who enter the Synod have assumed over towards resolutions regarding how the schools are to be erected, how teachers are to be appointed at them, and how the Synod is to exercise supervision over them. As an act which in itself is divisive, and which as surely as it is continued will steadily tend more and more to tear asunder and split the Synod and thus undermine not only its constitution and schools, but the Synod itself. Therefore, the Synod cannot tolerate in its members that such an activity is continued and must earnestly admonish those who have been along in it to admit their error and withdraw from it. That same year, the dissenters left the Norwegian Synod and formed the Anti-Missourian Brotherhood. In 1890, the Anti-Missourian Brotherhood joined with the Norwegian-Danish Augustana Synod and the Norwegian-Danish Conference to form the United Norwegian Lutheran Church in America. It is amazing, after such animosity, that the Norwegian Synod merged with the United Norwegian Lutheran Church in America only 27 years after the latter's founding. The time allotted for this essay does not permit a detailed account of the events that led to merger. Please permit me a brief overview. Already in 1890, there were some efforts to reach mutual understanding between the new United Church and the Norwegian Synod. The Norwegian Synod actually took the lead by inviting representatives of the United Church and the Haugus Synod. By the way, you'll find uh, Haugus Synod sometimes with an apostrophe S, Haugis Synod, other times Haugis Synod, it, it's the same group, to discuss the possibility of union. Responding to a memorial sent in by its Minnesota district, the Norwegian Synod passed the following resolution at its 1890 convention. The Synod acknowledges its obligation to work for unity among Norwegian Lutheran church bodies here in this country and shall, according to ability, seek to fulfill this obligation. Two, the further development of this matter shall be the task of the committee elected by the Synod. The Norwegian Synod's resolution resulted in a preliminary meeting in 1891 to determine how to proceed. Representatives of the Norwegian Synod and the United Church decided to have each Synod choose 30 representatives to discuss some of the issues that separated them. An invitation was also sent to the Haugas Synod. The meeting took place in Wilmar, Minnesota, January 6 through 12, 1892. Interestingly enough, the meeting was better attended by the Norwegian Synod than the United Church. The Haugas Synod did not participate. Three issues emerged, whether the two groups ought to join in prayer fellowship, whether the inspiration of scriptures ought to be a condition of union, and whether subscription to the entire book of Concord would be required. Uh, they did have a sense of prayer fellowship in those days. The Norwegian Synod had pressed for a statement, uh, excuse me, the United Church reluctantly agreed that the meeting would begin only with a devotional reading without joint prayer. In the other two matters, the opinion of the United Church prevailed. The Norwegian Synod had pressed for a statement on inspiration because it was a burning issue of the day, and some Norwegian Lutheran pastors had forsaken the old Lutheran doctrine of inspiration. Some were questioning the divine character of the Bible. The meeting ultimately did not accomplish anything substantial. However, there remained an openness to meet in spite of the new issues that had been raised. The issues dividing the various Norwegian groups were discussed at free conferences in 1897 and 1899 without resolving the differences. In 1900, the district conventions of the Norwegian Synod issued an invitation to the United Church to discuss doctrinal issues in a colloquy, which was to include the presidents of the two synods and their theological faculties. 
The meeting went nowhere because of the participation of Friedrich Schmidt of the United Synod. From 1902 to 1905, there were no more intersynodical discussions to resolve the doctrinal and practical issues separating the various Norwegian groups. The Hauga Synod issued an invitation to begin meetings again in 1905. Both the United Synod and Norwegian Synod responded favorably. Although progress toward merger was not steady and in fact seemed to be at a dead end in 1910, the meetings eventually resulted in the infamous Upjur, or Madison Settlement in 1912. The Upjur was a compromise agreement that allowed both versions of the doctrine of election to stand. There are a number of factors that eventually led to the merger. People, particularly the laity, were tiring of doctrinal disputes. There was also a rising tide of pride in Norwegian heritage, bringing Norwegian Americans together. In the late 19th and early 20th century, there arose a number of Norwegian American societies that attempted to preserve Norwegian culture and foster socializing. Athletic and musical clubs sprang up in communities where there's sufficient numbers of Norwegian immigrants and their descendants. The Norwegian musical heritage was particularly strong in binding together those of Norwegian descent. Performances of secular and religious music by Norwegian composers and even Norwegian folk music were weekly occurrences in some areas. Norwegian American cultural pride and identity began to have a moderating influence on the religious disputes common culture was beginning to trump doctrine. Churches drew strength from the fact that ethnic identity was closely tied to religion among immigrants, and eventually class hostilities brought from Norway and expressed in the doctrinal battles faded in in importance. The result was a distinct weaving of traditions of both the Norwegian peasant culture and the Norwegian elites in the American environment. At the same time, Ulrich Koren was aging and his influence was waning. The same convention that accepted the invitation of the Hauga Synod to meet also elected a new vice president. Dr. Koren, the leading theologian of the Norwegian Synod, had served as president of the Synod since the death of President Hermann Amberg Preuss in 1894. Corin had now reached the age of 79 and would not be able to serve as president much longer. The convention showed him the honor of re-electing him, but most delegates realized that the vice president would have to take over much of the work. The Senate elected Dr. Hans Stube to the latter office. Since Stube was a professor, he did not have the right to vote at the conventions. The Senate's constitution stipulated that the president must cast his vote in case any convention vote ended in a tie. To enable Stube to serve, the Synod quickly passed a resolution that in future any tie vote would be considered lost. One opponent of the eventual merger gives this opinion of Stube's election. He was the candidate of the more liberal element which considered that the leadership of the Synod hitherto had been too strict. During the convention, much propaganda was carrying on, and the slogan of the more liberal element was, let us break the decora ring. Stub was elected by vote of 181 of the 328 votes cast. The decora ring was a group of pastors and the theologians in and around Decorah, Iowa, led by Corin, which is opposed to the union if it meant compromising the synod's doctrinal position. Corin died in 1910. Thereafter, Stubb became a strong proponent and leader of the union movement in the Synod. Stubb at one time had been a defender of the Synodical Conference position in the election controversy. It's somewhat difficult to understand his change in attitude. He may have been caught up in the spirit of Norwegian nationalism and ethnic pride, or had grown weary of doctrinal controversy, or was gripped by the desire for the prestige that would be his as a leader of a larger church body, or perhaps by a combination of all three. There was a sizable minority in the Norwegian Synod opposed to the Madison Settlement. Their opposition was bolstered by the support of their brothers in the Synodical Conference. The Norwegian Synod's English periodical, Lutheran Herald, edited by the Missouri Synod's Theodore Grabner, 
was critical of the settlement. In May of 1913, the periodical contained a warning that if the Madison settlement was accepted in its upcoming convention, the Synod would be serving notice to the world that it no longer stands where it stood with Dr. Preuss, Dr. Corrin, Dr. Larson, and Dr. Stube 30 years ago. The article declared that in the past, the Norwegian Synod had tolerated the second form and others, but it had never accepted the expression without certain well-defined conditions. To accept that expression as coordinate and equal to the first form, after the second form had been used by others for 30 years to cloak false doctrine, simply was something quite different. The leaders of the Norwegian Synod sought approval for the Madison Settlement from the Synodical Conference at the latter's convention in Saginaw, Michigan in 1912. The convention devoted two days to the discussion of the settlement and then directed the Presidium to write a letter expressing concerns about the document. The letter was dated August 19, 1912 and was signed by Wisconsin Synod pastors Carl Gauswitz and John Meyer, the president and secretary of the Synodical Conference, respectively. Synodical Conference made these re requests. To eliminate from theses one through three of the Opure, the coordination of the so-called first and second form of doctrine, because only the first form represents the truth of the scriptures and of the confessions, while the second form is not found in God's word and the confessional writings of the Lutheran Church, and hence it is not entitled to such recognition in the church. Being as much as the present state of affairs in our American Lutheran Church demands a proper antithesis to synergistic doctrine, we pray you to take steps to bring about a rejection of the teaching that man's conduct, in particular his omission of the so-called willful resistance, either by his natural powers or by the power conferred by divine grace, is the reason by which we may explain why some are converted and elected rather than others, as our opponents in the American Lutheran Church teach. We pray you to enter into a fraternal discussion with us according to the scriptures and confessions and in the spirit of truth and of love of your former theses on the call and conversion and your present theses on election. Missouri's Franz Pieper published an evaluation of the Madison Settlement with an appeal for Lutheran unity. Pieper's evaluation was relatively mild. He noted that the Upier stated that the Missourian view was the doctrine of scripture in the Lutheran confessions. He declared that it was a great achievement that the Upier rejected synergism. He believed that discussion of election and conversion might be quite profitable and that agreement could be reached by a modification of the Upier. He still objected to the second form of the doctrine as an unscriptural expression that often provides a convenient cover for synergism. Pieper also noted that the problem historically was that the two sides had a different theological approach. The director of the Wisconsin Synod Seminary, John Schaller, critically com commented on the Upier in the seminary's theological journal, Theologische Quartalschrift. He objected to the Upiers allowing the two versions of the doctrine of election to stand in the Norwegian Synod's attitude toward doctrinal differences. The Synods of the Synodical Conference were concerned about the theological direction of the Norwegian Synod. Union based on a compromise agreement would result in a break in fellowship between the Synodical Conference and the Norwegian Synod. By the time of the 1917 convention, most of the minority changed their position on entering the merger. Representatives of the minority had been meeting with the joint committee of the three synods in another attempt to have changes made to the Upier. A subcommittee offered this statement in an attempt to appease the minority. The annual meeting is expressly aware of the three reservations concerning paragraphs 1, 3, and 4 of Upier, contained in a request by Professor C.K. Preuss and Reverend uh, Torreson and declares that in said request, nothing is found which contradicts the scriptures and conventions, but regards the position expressed in the above quoted request as an adequate expression for unity of faith. Wherefore, that group of men and congregations whose position is declared in the above quoted request are invited to join the new church under complete equality and mutual fraternal recognition. 
Note, it is self-evident that the above stated resolution must not be interpreted to mean that the Upyur as the basis for union between the three contracting churches is thereby abbreviated or changed. In other words, the subcommittee was taking note of the objections to the Upyur, but was inviting the minority to join anyway. This invitation and statement became known as the Austin Agreement or Settlement. The Austin Agreement was the Upyur with the changes suggested by the minority. The problem was that the three merging churches never adopted the Austin Agreement, yet most of the minority joined the merger on the basis of the Austin Agreement. The agreement itself was an indication that those who were behind the merger did not consider doctrinal differences to be divisive of fellowship. The first convention of the Norwegian Lutheran Church of America, later named the Evangelical Lutheran Church, was held in June of 1917 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The merger was finalized to a great deal of popular acclaim on both sides of the Atlantic and the heartbreaking dismay of the minority in the Norwegian Synod. The spirit of the times downplayed doctrinal differences in favor of outward unity. Hans Stubb, the president of the Norwegian Synod and prime mover in the Union movement, was elected the first president of the new Synod. A small number of pastors and laymen from the Norwegian Synod who could not in clear conscience enter the new church body met at the Hotel Aberdeen in St. Paul. They were joined by the Synodical Conference Committee, which had come to the Norwegian Synod Convention in an attempt to carry out the directive to meet with representatives of the Synod in a last attempt to dissuade them from merging on the basis of a compromise agreement. The members of the Synodical Conference Committee included Dr. Franz Pieper, Dr. W.H.T. Dow of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, and Professor Theodore Schleder of Wisconsin's Northwestern College in Watertown. The Synodical Conference Committee had requested a meeting with the Norwegian Synod prior to the 1917 convention, but their offer was declined. They came to the convention anyway and encouraged the small number of those who refused to go along with the merger. Franz Pieper is reported to have told the minority in these meetings in the hotel before the convention, what I am especially interested in is that you testify. Your testimony may not bear fruit for a hundred years, but it will bear fruit. The minority decided to rebuild the old Norwegian Synod on the Synod's old foundation. They elected interim officers but did not officially organize a synod because they wanted and needed the approval of their congregations. Pastor Duke Harstead of Parkland, Washington was elected president. Harstead had founded the school which became Pacific Lutheran University. That school remained with the merged synod. Pastor Johnny Molstead of Chicago was elected vice president. Pastor C.N. Peterson of Minneapolis was elected secretary and Pastor O.T. Lee of Northwood, Iowa was elected treasurer. Lee, unfortunately, died some nine months later. The group decided to publish a bi-monthly periodical, the Lutheran Times. Uh, the April 1st, 1918 issue contained this notice. Pastors and members of congregations who desire to continue in the old doctrine and practice the Norwegian Synod will, God willing, hold their annual meeting in the Lime Creek Congregation Pastor H. Ingebrigtsen's charge, June 14th and the following days. Lime Creek is in Winnebago County, Iowa, close to the Minnesota border. Thirteen pastors and approximately 200 others gathered for the founding convention of the Norwegian Synod of the American Evangelical Lutheran Church. However, because the governor of Iowa, in the heat of the nativism that was so prominent during World War I, had decreed that only English could be used in public gatherings, the group had to travel about one mile north into Minnesota and held their convention in a tent. The newly founded synod considered itself the legitimate heir and continuation of the original Norwegian synod, and indeed it was and is. 1918 to the present. In 1919, the little Norwegian synod applied, let me just explain that. Originally that was considered by the bigger groups a uh, derogatory term. I don't think it was, well, I know it wasn't used that way in the Synodical Conference. Uh, 
Growing up, I often heard that term, and there was nothing pejorative about it. It was just to distinguish it from the larger groups uh, of Norwegians. Um, the old Norwegian Synod had withdrawn from the Synodical Conference in the midst of the election controversy without severing ties with the members of the Synodical Conference. Reacting to the application of the Little Norwegian Synod, the Synodical Conference passed this resolution in 1920. One, resolved that the Norwegian Synod, the American Evangelical Lutheran Synod, be accepted as a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Synodical Conference of North America. Resolved that we welcome these brethren with great joy, encouraging them in their fight for the truth and wish them God's richest blessings for the future. Three, to our great sorrow, we are compelled to state that the Synod for the Norwegian Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, by holding fast to Upjur and its union with the other two Norwegian synods in the Norwegian Lutheran Church of America, has severed its bond of faith and church fellowship with the Synodical Conference. The Synodical Conference proceedings notes that 30 pastors and 20 congregations belong to the new synod. The Synodical Conference had suffered significant losses as a result of the election controversy. The exception of the Little Norwegian Synod brought joy to the three other members. In 1920, the Synodical Conference consisted of the Missouri Synod, the newly merged Joint Synod of Wisconsin and other states, the Slovak Synod, and the newly established Norwegian Synod. The doctrines of election and fellowship continued to divide the Synodical Conference from other Midwestern Lutheran Synods. From the time the Norwegian Synod re-entered the Synodical Conference, the close relationship among the Synods could be seen in their cooperation and ed educational endeavors. Norwegian Synod pastors and teachers were trained at the colleges and seminaries of the Missouri Synod and the Wisconsin Synod. In 1920, a committee of the Norwegian Synod asked permission to send young men and women to Dr. Martin Luther College to be trained for the teaching ministry. Since the Synod wished these future teachers to have a working knowledge of the Norwegian language, Oscar Leverson joined the faculty in 1922 and was called to serve as full-time professor in 1923. He served faithfully at DMLC until his retirement in 1963. By the way, this is the Wisconsin Synod account of that. Uh, ELS sources say that DMLC approached the ELS. There's probably a little truth in, in both of those. And the Norwegian Synod generally sends students studying for the pastoral ministry uh, to Missouri Synod schools. One early exception would be Nilak Chernagel, who is a graduate of Wisconsin Seminary. Uh, however, because of developments in the Missouri Synod in the 1940s, some students came to Northwestern College in Watertown and until Bethany Seminary was founded in 1946 to the seminary in Mequon. And so some in your midst uh, were in college with me. President Molstead was three years behind me in college, and I had never heard a Norwegian joke until... <laughs> Molstad came to our Watertown campus and was telling them constantly. I, I hear he still does. Right? <laughs> and President Schmeling was a year ahead of me in college. Uh, the sainted Mark Harstead was four years ahead of me in college. So there's, there's a lot of crossover. There. Uh, Professor Jewel Madsen is a graduate of Northwestern and our seminary as well. Um, the Norwegian Synod demonstrated commendable concern for Christian education by purchasing Bethany Ladies College in 1926 for $90,000. The action was a leap of faith for such a small group, but has paid lasting dividends. No one today would think about the Evangelical Lutheran Synod without at the same time thinking about Bethany Lutheran College. Who would have dreamed in 1926 that Bethany would grow into the college we see today with its many course offerings and beautiful campus. Bethany has been a blessing for the Wisconsin Synod as well. Not only have many Wisconsin Synod students over the years attended this school in their pursuit of a variety of careers, Bethany for a time filled an important role in the Wisconsin Synod's ministerial education system. Before Wisconsin's break with the Missouri Synod, most second career or non-traditional students received training for the pastoral ministry at Missouri's Practical Seminary Concordia 
in Springfield, which I believe 1976 was moved back to, to uh, Fort Wayne. Uh, the Wisconsin Synod did not think that Northwestern College was well suited for married students, so the Synod entered into an agreement. <laughs> well, our, our forefathers sometimes were, I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, entered in an agreement with ELS for Wisconsin second career students to receive their pre-seminary training at Bethany. The last of the graduates of the Bethany program, as it was called in Mequon, or the Mequon program, as it was called in Mankato, <laughs> came to Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary in the fall of 1988. By Synod resolution, the second career program was moved to Northwestern College, and the college was allowed to enroll married students. <laughs> From 1962 through 1988, more than 200 men had enrolled in the Bethany program. In 1988, the Northwestern Lutheran, commenting on the blessings of the program, reported that there were between 100 and 120 pastors currently serving in the Wisconsin Synod who had received their pre-seminary training at Bethany. In 1988, that amounted to about 10% of the active pastors in the Wisconsin Synod. The Bethany program served the Wisconsin Synod and its seminary well for 26 years, and the Synod owes Bethany and the ELS a, a debt of gratitude. The two synods stood side by side in the intersynodical controversy, which ultimately led to the end of the synodical conference. The Wisconsin Synod and the Norwegian Synod were opposed to Missouri's move toward fellowship with the ALC. The ALC had extended an invitation to Missouri to meet for discussions on future fellowship. Neither the Norwegian Synod nor the Wisconsin Synod received this invitation. In 1938, the ALC declared at its Sandusky Convention, we are firmly convinced that it's neither necessary nor possible to agree in all non-fundamental doctrines. Earlier that year, the Missouri Convention resolved uh, that, the re that the declaration of the representatives of the American Lutheran Church in a brief statement be regarded as the doctrinal basis for future church fellowship. The convention also declared that we endeavored to establish full agreement and indicated that the practice of the LC needed to be in harmony with their doctrinal position, particularly in regard to the issue of lodges. The president of the Missouri Synod was given authority to declare fellowship when full agreement was reached. The sticking point was the discussion of non-fundamental doctrines, particularly those which had historically been at issue between Missouri and Iowa. The Antichrist, the total conversion of the Jews, the millennium, uh, Saturday, uh, Sunday observance, and so forth. The ALC had some problems with the wording of the brief statement. Both the Norwegians and the Wisconsin Synod uh, reacted with concern to Missouri's agreement with the ALC. The Norwegian Synod declared that they could not regard the document as an adequate basis for future church fellowship. The Wisconsin Synod held that the ALC Sandusky resolutions indicated that doctrinal agreement had not been reached. The Synod also declared not two statements should be issued as a basis for agreement. A single joint statement covering the contested doctrines thetically and antithetically and accepted by both parties to the controversy is imperative. And furthermore, such doctrinal statement must be made in clear and unequivocal terms which do not require laborious additional statements. The sincerity of the statement must also be evidenced by a clean church practice. Negotiations between representatives of the ALC and the ULCA and the agreement reached between the two at Pittsburgh in 1940 made it evident that there was no real doctrinal agreement between the ALZ and, and Missouri. Part of the problem for the Wisconsin and Norwegian synods and for some in Missouri was the ALC's continuing membership in the American Lutheran Conference. This conference included the Norwegian Lutheran Church of America formed by a merger based on the doctrinal compromises of the Madison Settlement. Those who were faithful to the doctrinal position of the Synodical Conference could not ignore this. In 1940, the Synodical Conference asked Missouri not to enter fellowship with the ALC and to consider the advisability of framing one document of agreement. Missouri's 1941 convention resolved to continue negotiations with the ALC, 
but recognize the desirability of having one document establishing doctrinal agreement. Missouri asked its sister synods to send representatives to the joint meetings of the committee to prepare the document. Both the Wisconsin and Norwegian synods declined. Dr. J. Michael Roy of the ALC in a published article intimated that the ALC might object to the inclusion of the Norwegian and the Wisconsin synods in the discussions because his church body had not invited the other two synods previously for reasons of its own. The doctrine produced by Missouri and ALC representatives was called the Doctrinal Affirmation. Both the Norwegian and Wisconsin synods saw this effort as an improvement over using two statements for the resolution of doctrinal differences, but neither synod saw the document as a satisfactory statement or settlement of the historic differences between the ALC and Missouri. The Norwegian synod believed that the doctrinal affirmation had weakened the brief statement. Wisconsin was not satisfied that all previous errors had been excluded. A new joint ALC-Missouri document, the Common Confession, was presented to both the Missouri and ALC conventions in 1950. Missouri accepted the confession as a statement, in doctrinal, uh, a statement of doctrine and harmony with the scriptures. The Norwegian Synod Pastoral Conference meeting in November concluded that the Common Confession fell far short of its intended purpose. Some in the Norwegian Synod were already recommending an in statu confessionis declaration over against Missouri. The way it seemed to be used by the Norwegian synods and the Wisconsin synod, this meant now we're in a state of protesting fellowship. It's really the last step before a break in fellowship would occur. You have about 10 minutes. Okay, I'll read faster. Yeah. All right. Don't make it. I, I think I can do that. All right. Um, Wisconsin Synod meeting convention in August 1951 declared that the Common Confession was unacceptable in its statements on justification, conversion, election, the means of grace, scripture, and inspiration. In 1952, the Norwegian Synod directed an overture to the Synodical Conference that sufficient time be allotted on the agenda for a thorough discussion of the Common Confession and the continued doctrinal negotiations between the Missouri Synod and the American Lutheran Church. The preamble of the Synodical Conference's Floor Committee report concerning the Common Confession stated that the confession in its present form was inadequate as a settlement of differences and that that document had disturbed the unity of the Synodical Conference. The convention, however, dominated numerically by the Missouri Synod struck the preamble. A substitute motion was passed to postpone all further action on the subject until part two of the Common Confession was available. The voting showed a deeply divided synodical conference with the Missouri and Slovak synods on one side and the Norwegian and Wisconsin synods on the other. Because of the size of their synod, Missouri had the majority of the delegates at the convention. That majority reacted vocally in approval or disapproval of those who spoke in favor against the Common Confession. My grandfather was president of the Wisconsin Synod at the time. He was an old man, uh, 77 years old, I believe. When he got up and spoke against the common confession, he was booed and pounded, or uh, shouted down. Booed, booed and shouted down. Uh, that upset the Wisconsin Synod delegation so much they met privately and declared that they were now in statu confessionis with the Missouri Synod. As requested by Wisconsin in 53, the 1954 Synodical Conference Convention gave all its attention to seven essays on the issues in controversy. Three, issues, uh, three essays concerned the Common Confession, one each by a representative of Missouri, Wisconsin, and the Norwegian Synod. Two essays presented the military chaplaincy and scouting, one by Missouri, one by Wisconsin. Two essays covered various other issues related to fellowship, one each by Missouri and Wisconsin. After hearing the essays, a majority in the Synodical Conference passed a resolution requesting that the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod not use the Common Confession as a functioning union document without, however, passing judgment pro or con on the doctrinal content of the Common Confession. The resolution asking Missouri not to use the Common Confession as a functioning document was not an indication of any change in Missouri's position 
The common confession was passing from the scene anyway because the ALC was moving toward union with the other members of the American Lutheran Conference. 30 delegates from the Norwegian Wisconsin Synods asked that their negative votes be recorded. An additional 23 advisory delegates had their protest recorded. An overture presented earlier in the convention asking the Synodical Conference to reject the common confession because it did not define or safeguard the scripture doctrine taught in the brief statement was signed by 51 Missouri Synod members. Missouri was clearly a house divided. By 1955, the Norwegian Synod became convinced that the Missouri Synod had, fall, had fallen under the condemnation of Romans 16, 17, and 18 because of their persistence in error and terminated fellowship. The Norwegian Synod remained in the Synodical Conference and in fellowship with the Wisconsin Synod. Synodical Conference met in December of 1956. The convention resolved that the union committees and the members' synods were to meet jointly and draw up a list of problems stating clearly the status controversiae of each case, said each synod's view properly expressed in thetical and antithetical form, discuss them throughout the various synods and present their evaluations to the 1958 convention. It also suggested a conclave of, theolog a conclave of theologians of overseas brethren to assist in the solution of the unresolved doctrinal problems. The Synodical Conference and Convention in 1958 received a statement on scripture. It was also reported that a statement on the Antichrist was nearing completion and that extensive agreement respecting the principles underlying an evaluation of the Scout Movement was brought to light. In October, the Joint Committee adopted the final form of the statement on scripture and on the Antichrist. All four constituent synods of the Synodical Conference met in 1959. Missouri, Wisconsin, the ELS, and the Slovak Synod all adopted the statement on scripture. Wisconsin also adopted the statement on the Antichrist. The Wisconsin Synod had instructed its theologians on the Joint Committee to continue to work until agreement in doctrine and practice had been attained or until an impasse was reached, revealing a doctrinal difference and indicating that no agreement could be brought about. In May 1960, the committee declared that such an impasse had been reached on the doctrine of fellowship. The Wisconsin Synod of the ELS produced statements in accord with the historic teaching of the Synodical Conference that fellowship can be practiced, excuse me, that no fellowship can be practiced without full doctrinal agreement. In opposition to this unit concept of fellowship, the Slovak and Missouri Synods maintained a distinction between joint prayer and prayer fellowship and contended for a growing edge of fellowship toward those outside their synods. The 1960 Synodical Conference Convention had been recessed until May 1961, but could not resolve the impasse on fellowship when the convention reconvened. Wisconsin Synod and Convention, having received the report of the impasse on fellowship, voted to terminate fellowship with the Missouri Synod by a vote of 124 to 49. In 1962, both the ELS and the Wisconsin Synods asked the Synodical Conference to dissolve itself. When that did not happen, both Synods withdrew from the Synodical Conference membership in 1963. Throughout the intersynodical controversy, the Evangelical Lutheran Synod and the Wisconsin Synod stood side by side, united in doctrine and practice during a controversy that was often heartbreaking and bitter. That they did is evidence of God's grace or two small church bodies. God's grace has also been evident in the mission efforts of both synods. Both synods supplied a number of missionaries to the Synodical Conference Nigerian mission. The mission-mindedness of the ELS can be seen in the remarkable number of countries of the world to which the ELS has either sent missionaries or provided financial and educational support to groups already existing. The countries include England, Peru, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Chile, Ukraine, the Czech Republic, Latvia, Australia, Norway, India, and South Korea. Not every effort has been successful by human standards, but the Lord of the Church grants the success he desires in his own good time. Many of these countries have established confessional Lutheran churches today because of the faithful efforts of the ELS. Home mission efforts have also been impressive. From 1926 to 2013, some 58 mission congregations were planted. 
Other established congregations have joined the ELS for confessional reasons. God has blessed the ELS with numerical and geographical growth. Over the past 50 years, the greatest geographical expansion has been in Florida, California, Washington, and Oregon. The ELS in 1967 had 83 congregations, five of which were outside the Midwest. 2018, the ELS numbers some 130 congregations with more than 40 outside the Midwest. Many thought that the ELS and the Wisconsin Synod would have difficulty surviving a break in fellowship with the Missouri Synod. They were wrong. Our synods have continued to survive and even prosper. Our fellowship has proved to be a real blessing to both synods. Our forefathers recognized the need for official contact between our two synods to preserve that precious fellowship. In 1966, now just on the date there, 1966, the two presidents uh, got together to arrange for the first meeting of the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Confessional Forum. The, the first full meeting occurred in April of 67. Um, this is popularly called the Ells Wells Forum. Representatives from the various departments of Wells and Ells meet to discuss matters of common interest and concern and to review the doctrinal essays presented at each other's conventions. Forum also provides the opportunity to express concerns and raise questions about the work and practice in each synod. It provides mutual encouragement and helps prevent duplication of effort or unhealthy competition. At first, the confessional forum met annually. In the early 1980s, the confessional forum switched to biennial meetings. The two synods alternate hosting the meeting. The ELS Doctrine Committee up till this year uh, has met with the Wells Commission on Interchurch Relations to discuss areas of concern in the years the confessional forum does not meet. One of the most significant developments in the history of the Evangelical Lutheran Synod and the Wisconsin Synod is their cooperation in the founding and promotion of the Confessional Evangelical Lutheran Conference. After our two synods left the conference, there was a longing for the establishment of a similar organization to express fellowship and to provide mutual encouragement and support. There were repeated suggestions from Ells and Wells leaders to do so. By the mid-1980s, the time seemed right to pursue the organization. Representatives of the Wells Commission on Air Church Relationship met in Leipzig, Germany, April of 1986, with representatives of the Evangelical Lutheran Free Church to discuss, among other things, a new synodical conference. The CIC report in the 1986 Wells Report to the 12 districts included a proposal for a new international conference. The ELS reacted favorably to the proposal. In January 1987, the Wells CICR and ELS Doctrinal Committee resolved that the two committees seek approval from their respective synods in 1987 for the appointment of a committee of six, three to be appointed by the ELS Doctrine Committee and three by Wall CICR to begin preliminary work for a new conference and to present its recommendations to the ELS Doctrinal Committee and Wall CICR. Wisconsin Synod Professors Wilbur Gavrish, Lyle Lang, and Armin Panning, and ELS Pastor Galen Schmeling, Professor Wilhelm Peterson, and Professor Jewel Madsen were appointed to the committee. On October 18, 1988, at the meeting of the Evangelical Lutheran Confessional Forum, Pastor Dwayne Tomhave, administrator of the Wells Board for World Missions, read an essay entitled, Synods of Mission-Minded Confessional Lutherans, stating that gospel outreach goes hand in hand with the objective of preserving the truth of scripture. The proposed conference was to carry out that twofold purpose. After much planning, the first convention of the CLC took place in April of 1993 at a youth hostel on the Rhine, about an hour's drive from Frankfurt. Invitations had been sent to several churches and synods, including Wells and Ells Missions. Some of the younger mission churches did not consider themselves ready for active participation in such an organization. Thirteen accepted the invitation. Today, on the 25th anniversary of the founding of the CELC, the organization numbers 32 church bodies from around the world. More will be seeking reception as, as members at the next CELC convention in 2020. The grace of our God is truly amazing. 
Both of our synods are evidence of that fact, and God has used both of our synods to proclaim his message of salvation worldwide and to preserve the legacy of confessional Lutheranism. What about the future? The history of our two synods is intertwined. Those histories are an account of God's grace in leading our forefathers to a clear confession and preserving them in his truth. Yet we would be naive if we were to think that there will be no challenges to the fellowship we enjoy. We remain sinners living in a sin-filled world. We're the church militant. We can be certain that Satan will do his best to disrupt the relationship we treasure. On the one hand, false doctrine and practice can arise. On the other hand, it is human nature to jump to conclusions, even wrong conclusions, about each other's words and actions. Misguided synodical pride can contribute to the problem. Thoughtless words and actions can cause irritations. Because each synod has come from a unique background and experience, we may approach opportunities and problems in different ways leading to misunderstandings. In our practice, we dare not run roughshod over consciences, run ahead without brotherly consultation, or imply that matters of adiaphron are divisive of fellowship. At times, we may say the same things, but with a different accent. German accent, Norwegian accent. I mean, there's something to that from our history, actually. Um, and now I lost my place. And our, uh, we need to listen carefully to each other so that we don't talk past each other. Asking questions first rather than making accusations is important in fraternal relations. There's a difference between concern for each other's synod and suspicion. In times of doctrinal strife, we'll strive to retain the hermeneutics or approach to theology that characterize the work of Haneke and Corinth. We will want to do our best to follow in the footsteps of our synodical fathers in faithfulness to scripture and a cooperative spirit in the work our God places before us. The Lord of the Church led our forefathers to support each other in times of controversy, to cooperate in ministerial education, and more recently to establish the CELC, which is providing comfort, encouragement, and assistance to small confessional Lutheran church bodies around the world. As we look at our intertwining history, all we can do is thank God for his grace in preserving our blessed fellowship and pray for his continued blessing in the future. To him alone be glory. Thank you.